Okay, so let me introduce Trish. Um, Trish Rose Sandler is a Data Projects Officer at the Department of Biodiversity Informatics in the Missouri Bot Botanical Garden. Uh, she's going to talk about the Art Life Project and pur Purposeful Gaming uh, at the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Okay. Hi there, everyone. I just wanted to um, thank Mahindra and the British Library for inviting me to come talk today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but uh, virtually we'll have to do for now. And um, so I wanted to start the talk with uh, giving you a little bit of context of the work that uh, I and my colleagues do in the Center for Biodiversity Informatics. So let me talk about first about BHL, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, if some of you are not familiar with it. Essentially, it is a consortium of natural history, botanical libraries, and research institutions who come together to digitize their collections and provide them online. It is an open access digital library for historic biodiversity literature, so we are a domain-specific repository on plants and animals. And it is an open data repository of taxonomic names and bibliographic information. These are our current members. We have about 16 members and five affiliates from very large institutions uh, that you'll recognize, such as the Library of Congress, Smithsonian uh, Institution Libraries, and even some of your own UK colleagues on there, the Kew Gardens, and of course the Natural History Museum in London. And what began as a US, UK based project that has grown quite large now, and it's become a global, have many global partners from Europe to China. We have partners in Australia, Egypt, Brazil, Africa, and most recently, Singapore. So we, uh, BHL serves its content primarily through the Internet Archive, and we also built a custom portal, which I'm showing you here, which is located at biodiversitylibrary.org. Subsets of our content are also shared with other primary aggregation sites, such as Europeana and the Digital Public Library of America. And you can see here, this is the uh, current stats. We have over 45 million pages of text. And this is just a uh, screenshot of our book viewer. Uh, it's showing you how you can navigate the book structurally. And it's also showing you there on the lower right, you'll see scientific names on this page. This is a really important access point for our primary users, which are taxonomists, who need to be able to trace the first published listing of a species name and then track its use over time. And much like the British Library, our books and journals also contain millions of beautiful illustrations. And our illustrations in particular document some of the earliest scientific um, discoveries of plants and animals. And just an example, here is, a, here is the first published illustration of a platypus from a 1799 publication. And sometimes these illustrations are actually the only record that we have of rare, endangered, or even extinct species. And you see here the dodo bird. So despite this critical mass of content that we have, we have limitations on ways of searching it and exploring it. So for instance, we have almost no descriptive information about the illustrations, what pages contain those illustrations, or the subjects that they represent. And we have manually tagged some of those uh, which ones have images, but this effort really doesn't scale well to the millions of illustrations that we know that we have. And despite a lot of user requests, the, uh, we have not implemented full text searching as of yet. That's primarily because of the poor quality of the OCR that we have. So historically, um, historic texts print a lot of, present a lot of problems for OCR software because of their varying fonts and type settings. And then we also have some handwritten uh, field notebooks which OCR is kind of at a total loss to interpret. And so what we did is we, we went to funders and we were um, proposing ways of building tools and we wanted to crowdsource metadata. We also wanted to correct metadata and we just wanted to overall improve our access to this content and get it out there more widely. So today I'm gonna to talk about two projects that we are currently working on dealing with images. One of the Art of Life, which is a project to uh, find and describe the natural history illustrations and the other is Purposeful Gaming and BHL, which is a project to improve access to the text output through um, transcription and verification of words within a game. So Art of Life, it was a grant that was given to the Missouri Botanical Garden. 
We have partners from the Indianapolis Museum of Art Lab, and we have partners from the University of Colorado Boulder. It was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it is a three-year project which will end in April of 2015. These are the uh, four primary stages that our illustrations go through in the project. So extraction is where we are building algorithms and running them across the corpus to find out where these illustrations are. Classification is the stage where we actually enlist volunteers to help us uh, put these illustrations into broad categories such as drawing or map, for example. And we then um, push the resulting illustrations out to description platforms for crowdsourcing the metadata. And then, of course, we want to ultimately we want to share it. We want to bring it back into the BHL Porter for our users to search, but we also want to share it more widely with other platforms. So our project partners at the Indianapolis Museum of Art Labs built the algorithms for us. They initially developed four algorithms. Uh, the first algorithm had to do with the, the picture block metadata that comes out of the OCR output, tells you the coordinates of where they think the illustrations are. And then the other three algorithms had to do with the actual quali uh, qualities from the image files themselves, dealing with contrast, color, and compression. And what we found was that, um, well, uh, let me mention, they, so they did um, an analysis tool, which is the screenshot that you see here, in order to help us assess the accuracy of each of these algorithms. Uh, we found that the Abbey, or sorry, the picture block, it was actually Abbey was the specific OCR software that we were using, um, and the contrast were the most effective, coming in at about 87, 88% effectiveness, and the color and compression were much less effective, and we decided in the end to drop those and only run the picture block and the contrast algorithms across the full corpus. So in that second stage that I mentioned, the classification, we had Smithsonian Institution Libraries, which is one of the BHL partners. They developed a tool called Macaw for us, and that essentially was a way for volunteers to go in and bring up each book for which, uh, which it had pages that the algorithms had identified and just put them into some very broad groupings. Uh, so whether it was a drawing, it was a table, a map, a photograph, or a book plate. And also, if there were no images on the page, we also wanted them to mark that because we knew that, um, that the algorithms weren't 100% effective. We wanted to catch those false positives as well. Some people may wonder why we bothered with this classification step before we actually push it out to descriptive platforms. A couple of reasons. We felt this, this step was necessary because, again, we wanted to catch the false positives. We wanted to assess the types of illustrations that we had in BHL and whether or not we wanted to further describe them, like book plates often. We don't necessarily need to describe them uh, more than other just saying it's a book plate. And um, it gives us a very rudimentary way of browsing across the images. So in the um, descriptive stage, we tested several different platforms for crowdsourcing image descriptions. We chose um, Flickr. That's actually a platform that we've been using since 2011, and we have about 93,000 pages that we pushed out to our BHL Flickr stream. And, uh, but like the British Library, we wanted to do this on a much larger scale, and we can do this now through the Art of Life processes. And as a matter of fact, um, the researcher Caleb Lederu has already uploaded BHL images to Flickr as part of the 2.6 million uh, images that were pulled from the Internet Archive. Now, the problem for us was there was no identifying metadata um, in those sets that said that it came from the BHL collection or even which library contributed it. So we're actually working with Internet Archive and Flickr to get that metadata added. And I'm really excited to see, uh, I still looked at Mario Klingman's map of the book subjects um, application, which will be very useful in navigating this massive um, image set. We're also looking to other image media platforms. Wikimedia Commons is one that we have a um, very small number of images up, but would like to increase that. And we recently entered into a partnership with Zooniverse through the, the AHRC-funded Constructing Scientific Communities Project, or some of you may have heard of it. It's also known as the CONSCICOM project. It brings together historians of uh, 19th century and 21st century scientists to investigate amateur engagement with science. And the CONSCICOM team are building a custom Zooniverse interface for us and so that we can engage citizen scientists with our illustrations. Specifically, we're putting the 19th century periodicals up there. And um, we expect that to go live in late spring or early summer of 2015. 
So let me jump over to the Purposeful Gaming Project. This was, again, a um, grant that was given to Missouri Botanical Garden. Our partners on this project are Harvard, Cornell, and New York Botanical Garden. It was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and it is a two-year project that will end in November of 2015. Now, the goal of this project is to address full text searching of digital text. This is a major challenge, not only for BHL, but any digital libraries. And as I mentioned before, the full text searching of historic text is really problematic. And here's just a, one example of a um, 18th century publication. This is actually Linnaeus's Species Plantarum, published in 1753, with the OCR quality on the right there. Here is an example of the handwritten text that we have. And I, I noticed also there was talk about the uh, transcriptorium tool, so I'm hopeful that uh, there's some work going on in that area that might improve that state of affairs. And so we needed a way to get the public in helping us do some text correction, but we wanted to make it fun and engaging, and we decided to present the task as a game. So of course we're not the first library to um, come up with this idea. The folks at the National Library of Finland uh, had done this previously with OCR output from their newspaper collection through the digital coot game. But we felt like crowdsourcing um, through gaming had really been a very unexploited thing within US libraries, and we wanted to give it a try with uh, lots of different types of text. So books and journals, horticultural seed and nursery catalogs, uh, diaries, and field notes. And here's our workflow diagram for the project. So essentially what we do is we generate two OCR outputs for every page. So either that's coming from the OCR or that is coming from transcriptions in the case of the handwritten field notebooks. We then do an automated text comparison and we send the differences to the game. Now the game needs both the outputs and it also needs word coordinates to be able to extract a picture of the word from the page and present it to the user. And the, OC, uh, the OCR outputs provide these coordinates for us, but the transcription outputs do not. When we were looking for a transcription tool to use, we surveyed, we did a pretty extensive survey of all the open source transcription tools that were out there, and none of them provided that coordinate functionality. So uh, this is really where Desmond's tool, Tilt2, comes into play. Uh, we were excited when we heard about it, and it could be really extremely valuable to us in getting that coordinate information. We've sent him some of our data for testing with our tool, and it looks like right now the tool is about 70% accurate on our data, um, but we would really need it to be probably 100% accurate or at least to have a, some kind of a manual editing tool for the Tilt 2 to be useful to us. We are currently working with our game designer, Tilt Factor, they're from Dartmouth, and to design two games for us, we're designing one for gamers and one for non-gamers. We knew a lot of the BHL community would be very interested in helping us with this task. And a lot of them don't come from the gaming community, so we needed sort of two different types of games geared towards two different types of audiences. Tilt Factor has a lot of experience with crowdsourcing metadata through gaming and their metadata games platforms. Uh, we know that the British Library has been working with them as well. And we expect our games to go live in May of 2015. So that wraps up my talk, and uh, this is just some um, sites here for where you can get more information about our projects. Uh, check out the biodiversitylibrary.org if you haven't gone there before. We have lots of amazing stuff. And feel free to contact me with any questions that you have. Okay, thank you, Trish. <laughs> okay, so we're still screen sharing for the moment, um, just to warn you. Um, uh, time for maybe one or two questions. Any questions? No, no questions. <laughs> okay. Yes, sorry. Uh, so, um, do we have to relay this? Yeah, I may have to relay this um, if you so can't hear it. You, so, I think we might have a group, okay? Is that um, a lot of people who get involved in the sort of crowdsource tagging um, take it really seriously. They invest serious energy.
see that he's at the show. Okay. Did you hear that, Chris? Uh, well, he was asking about tagging of images, but then he uh, mentioned that putting that task into a game <clears throat> creates some tension. Was that the essence of? Yeah, pretty much. Just, I, sorry, I just want to contrast the game version of it with a kind mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, a serious amateur tool um, uh, that lets you, you know, you know, a single person maybe does thousands of tags versus mm -hmm. um, plays a game for 15 minutes. Right. Um, well, just one thing I should clarify, or maybe I didn't, it wasn't clear. So our game is um, not for tagging the images. Our game is actually for, for going in and verifying the, the text. So users are going to be presented pictures of words um, that, the, that the outputs did not interpret very well, and they're going to tell us what they think that word is. So it's different from um, the image tagging. But in terms of, uh, I, I do think your, your point about two different audiences and, and different maybe motivations. So it's one of the reasons why we decided to create two different games. Because we knew that there would be some gamers, uh, some people are coming from the gaming community who had different motivations they want to get. Um, they're not so caring so much about the research aspects of what they're doing, but they're just playing the game for fun. And they want to get points and they want to be on leaderboards and things like that. Um, there's a very different motivation for people who are coming from um, the research community or citizen scientists who are doing it because they understand the impact um, to, to the world at large and they, they're just doing it for the greater good. Um, and so when we're having Tilt Factor design the what we call the non-gamers games, um, it's not a timed game, for instance, where it is with the gamers game. Um, so we're, we're, we're not putting the same pressures on them as we would with the gamers. And um, we're, just, we're just approaching it a little bit differently because we know that the motivations are different, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much, Trish. Okay, if you could yep. stay on the line um, okay. and maybe if you mute your microphone. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, unfortunately, we, we were going to have a panel discussion um, for the last half an hour, but I think I'm going to uh, come up with a different idea. Mm -hmm. Similar, um, what I thought we would do, we've got about about 10 minutes. Um, what I thought I would do is ask some of the presenters uh, what they learned from some of the other presenters. You know, taking one thing from what they learned from something else and how they might apply it in their own field. So any, anybody want to start? Ian, you were quite you were quite impressed yeah, with Mario's work, so yeah. let, maybe if I start with you. Um, but I'm really very impressed with the other two guys are doing. There's um, different approaches to um, comparing and contrasting images um, uh, at, at the implementers and at, at different dimensions. Um, neural networks are mentioned at, um, over there, so I just think it's exciting. There's lots of different ways. Of Sorry to pick on you first. No, no. Um, <laughs> Mario. Okay. Well, obviously, I was like uh, kind of shocked by, by you guys. Like, like you pretty much had figured it out. And uh, yeah, the convolution of neural networks was definitely something I have to now go deeper into. Because I mean, I have like kind of uh, read about it and not really started, but now I definitely will because this seems like the whole key to learning that is my love. It's and also the world freely available on our group website, which I just say, if you type BGG, BGG into Google, you'll get the first link. We've got freely available code to compute um, feature from CNNs that you can use on your computer to figure out. And uh, of course I love the, the pixel puzzles. I mean, uh, definitely, and, and the approach of using Just because I, I find that topic also to be very interesting. 
Actually, have you, did you take part, part in that DARPA challenge where they try to reassemble all these shredded documents? Yeah, we um, actually, we briefly looked at it. And uh, it looked very, very familiar in many aspects. But what we figured is we have you know, a lot of machinery together for processing a fragment and mapping them and so on. But that machinery was so heavily geared for fresh build fragments and these 3D data sets and so on. Uh, whereas the DARPA challenge, you know, th those were scraps of paper. They were partly deformed, partly scribbled upon, and uh, it just would have meant a massive effort tackling that. And uh, the thing with these DARPA challenges is you need, you need a, a big team that can really work on this exclusively. And we just didn't see a very sufficient capacity for the one. But what it, was, what it was really exciting to see about the DARPA challenge outcomes is <coughs> that the more successful teams basically use cloud sourcing. So they, and, and many, and the most successful ones actually right, right from the back. They didn't treat this as you know some sort of wonky algorithm or something on the server. It's uh, we bought some cloud source and they just built their solutions around it. And that is actually also an avenue that we are currently pursuing. Um, so I, I find it quite inspiring. Quite inspiring. So was there anything today that you particularly <coughs> found? On my, on my side, right. Yeah. Um, I was uh, I was particularly thinking. Sometimes I hear presentations and think already on the next the next project. <laughs> and uh, I like I like this uh, Conrad Taylor's observation about how many you know how the quality in which certain things are, are available is often better than than not being available, but that how that often does not do justice to the medium, and that resonates with my interest in the materiality and, and the, the materials and substance of the city. So. Uh, you know, I'd be curious whether there's been some, whether there is a potential way to upsample woodcut carvings based on pure JPEG, but by using knowledge of how an artist was actually carving out of wood. Okay. So that I think there's an opportunity for um, for the existing databases that may have been acquired, you know, with, with ten year ten years ago cameras see whether we can enhance these images <laughs> by incorporating knowledge about the medium. So that was an idea that, that just sparked my Conrad. <laughs> well, I, I can return the compliment because <coughs> I, um, I, I, as an information designer, I'm very much interested in the philosophy of design and the idea that you design a scanning setup. I think you had, towards one of the ends of your slides, Tim, you had a sort of multi-dimensional, multi-factorial decision um, compass, if, uh, if you like, about all the things you have to take into account. And of course, the, um, the Microsoft scanning project using the planetary scanners was fantastic in terms of its efficiency at turning pages and taking snapshots. Um, it came with a trade-off. But looking to or some of the other presentations, if one were to kind of speculatively imagine that there might be a way of uh, deciding that a certain set is socially useful to get at a higher resolution, for example, images that teachers could use for history lessons, then of course we've got to be able to find those within the image databases, and that's where the majority of the presentations that we've made today about how you can automate the indexing and the finding of these things become very important, a sort of triage, so that you know what ones you want to go after. Um, Trish, while you're on, while you're on. Okay, back on. <laughs> um, was there anything? I think you kind of hinted at it. You want you what you've already been working with Desmond on tilt, and you want you want tilt two. Is there anything else? Yes, we want tilt two. Uh, we would love to. You know, the the classification step that we took on um, ended up taking a lot longer than we expected. So we've only classified, uh, I think at this point, about, uh, what is it, 50,000 pages, which is um, pretty small considering we know we have millions of these to look at. So um, we would love to be able to find tools that would help us with that classification step. And it seems to me that there is a lot of 
work being done in that area of um, automated image rec recognition patterns uh, that I think could help with that. Because we're really just trying to you know, classify these things into very general groupings, maps. And I would think that computers could dis make those distinctions somewhat easily between the difference between a map and a photograph. And um, we, went, we did go and meet with some folks at the Washington University here in St. Louis in the engineering department. And we're asking them about if there were any tools out there, kind of off-the-shelf tools that we could work with for this automated classification, and they weren't aware of any. Okay. Um, we're kind of short of time, so I'm just going to just pick on two more people. Um, um, any challenge, any, anybody, any takers for David Normal's um, collage tool? I was going to say it'd be really good for a grouping of card companies. Like if you wanted to do some of the card and you wanted a, a, an ostrich wearing a suit holding a set. <laughs> Any of the other presenters want to make any final comments? We've got one more opportunity. Okay, yes. Sorry, I'm going to zoom out there. Um, there was an idea that was mentioned in a couple of different presentations today that um, we could, your methodology 